right. We are continuing our series called Making Sense Out of Nonsense. As you can see, the, uh, the picture and our, our theme here is the guy with his head exploding uh, because these are topics that we have been discussing and we'll discuss for another uh, week on topics that make your head want to just blow off the top, right? Uh, things that just don't make sense. And today we're talking about violence. We've talked about a number of things, including abortion and gay rights, gender confusion, uh, racism, things of that sort. Today we're going to talk about violence. Uh, and violence comes in all forms, doesn't it? Uh, a number of people, a number of you have told me over the years that you've been abused at, at some point or another in your life. Abuse is a form of violence, and it doesn't always take just physical form. Sometimes that can be mental abuse. Sometimes it can be verbal abuse. Either way, it's abuse, and it's violent in that sense. So we want to talk about that as well as physical violence uh, in the message today. But before we do that, let's get started with a word of prayer, shall we? Father, once again, we are recognizing that we are a needy people. And Father, we see that more in ourselves each and every day. We are not self-sufficient. We are grateful that we have you to sustain us, to protect us, to provide for us. Lord, we need your provision once again today, not just physically, but spiritually. Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit would be not only in the midst of us in this room today, but in our hearts, in our lives, in our minds, our souls, to speak to us the words that you have for us today. I ask, Lord, that your words would go forth as you would intend. I pray that your Holy Spirit would take your words and apply them to each of our hearts, our lives, our situations. I pray, Lord, that through that, we would all be drawn closer, not just to each other, but especially to you. May this message accomplish that which is pleasing to you. May your words go forth and not mine. May your thoughts go forth and not mine. May I decrease as you increase, and as you are lifted up, may all of us and others be drawn to you. For we ask it all in Jesus' name, for his sake, and with thanksgiving. Amen. Today's message is, uh, of course, I I include a lot of Scripture in in my messages, but today's going to be especially more so. I'm going to let the Scripture do most of the talking today as we go through this. So we'll be going back and forth a lot in Scripture. So if you have your Bible, you might want to move really quickly with me as we go through some of these. And, of course, they'll be on the screen as well. But we want to talk about violence and starting. We want to start out with where we left off last week. I don't know if you remember the last verse we talked about last week when it came to gender confusion. Remember we talked about being content with who you are. Remember that? Not being dissatisfied with who you are and wanting to be something that you're not, but being content with who you are. And that passage, this one right here, applies in a number of different ways. Now, again, as I mentioned last week, Paul here was talking about his financial situation when he wrote this passage, but the application goes far beyond finances to, oh, oh I didn't have it up there. That, there it is. Uh, the application goes far beyond everything else. Uh, that, that we do in life. I mean, it applies to anything. We need to be content because discontent leads to restlessness. And that's your first blank on your handout. Discontent leads to restlessness. So if we are content, we won't be restless. Now, when I'm talking to somebody and after I talk to somebody about the gospel, somebody who doesn't know the Lord as Savior, and that may well be the case with some of you in this room, if, if you do not remember a time and a place when you've turned from your sin and trusted in Christ as your Savior, if you do not know beyond the shadow of a doubt that if you died today, you would spend eternity in heaven starting today, if you don't know that for sure, then my prayer for you is not content. I don't want you to be content. In your case, if you are not a believer, I'm praying for restlessness in your soul until you come to rest in Christ. One preacher I heard pray about that. He, he, he prayed, Lord, put rocks in their bed so they can't even sleep at night until they get saved. Our job, my job, our job as a church, my job as a pastor is to, I'm going to quote the Columbus Citizen Journal. Anybody remember the old uh, morning newspaper in Columbus, the Citizen Journal? This quote actually came out of the daily newspaper. A church's job and a pastor's job is to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. I love that quote. 
to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. That is what Jesus did. Remember, he preached about hell most often to the religious people because they were comfortable in themselves. They were self-righteous, thought they didn't need anything. We don't want to be that way. We don't want to be content in ourselves. We are not self-sufficient. We need to find our comfort in Christ, amen? Our sufficiency is in Him. So, Paul says, I, not that I speak in respect of want or need, I have learned. Now, that, that means it's not instant. When you get saved, it doesn't instantly mean that you're content with everything. It's a process. He had to learn to be content. He learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. Remember, he wrote this from prison. <laughs> so, he knows what he's talking about. <clears throat> but Paul had learned to be humble. Remember, he was pretty haughty and high-minded, self-righteous, as a Pharisee, as a member of the Jewish ruling council called the Sanhedrin, his job was to prosecute Jewish people who had converted to the Christian faith. His job was to arrest them, to try them, to convict them, to condemn them if necessary, and to kill them if necessary. He was high and mighty, had all that power, all that authority, all that respect for other people, and, and he thought that uh, that, that he was better than everybody else. But he had learned, he had learned to be humble. And that's your next blank. Jesus was humble too. As Paul became more like Jesus, Paul became humble. But Jesus was humble and he is our example. We see this in the letter that Paul wrote to the Philippians, same letter we, we just quoted just a minute ago in chapter 4. Back in chapter 2, he says this, let this mind be in you. Mind or mindset, we would call it today which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, meaning the essence of God himself, Jesus is God in the flesh, right? Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. That word is a bond slave, the lowest form of slave in, in that society at that time. The, the one whose job was to take the sandals off the feet of visitors and wash their feet as they entered the house, which is why he did that in John chapter 13 to his disciples at the Last Supper. He took the form of the lowest servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death. And not just any death, but the death of the cross. It goes on to say, well, if I can keep up with it. The death of the cross which was the most humiliating form of execution that I think that man has ever devised. So he was humble. And because of that, we also are expected to be humble. There we go. We are expected to be humble as well. That's your next blank. This is one of the character qualities that God values the most in us. In Micah chapter 6, verse 8, we're told, He hath showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. If you were to go through the Scripture and look at the things that God hates the most, you'll find that it's pride. This was Satan's besetting sin. This was, this was what caused his downfall, was pride. He thought he was all that in a bag of chips. And because of that, he was demoted from being the chief angel and instead became the chief demon. And God judges everyone who was lifted up with pride. One of the things that helps keep a person out of heaven is their own pride. We have to humble ourselves to realize that we are each of us a sinner in need of a Savior. We each of us have to realize that we do not deserve to go to heaven. We each of us have to realize that we deserve to go to hell. You wouldn't be in this church today. You wouldn't be claiming the name of Christ today. You wouldn't be on your way to heaven today unless you believe that you don't deserve to go to heaven. You believe that you deserve to go to hell. I still believe that. I deserve to be in hell right now. I don't deserve anything that God has done for me. It's only by His grace that we're saved. Philippians chapter, uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Again, Paul wrote that. He understood what grace was. He was not saved by works of righteousness. He had plenty of them, but he wasn't saved by them. 
So we are expected to be humble, and pride, the opposite of humility, leads to contention. Always. Always. Look at this passage written by the wisest man who ever lived. Proverbs 13.10, written by Solomon, only, look at that word, only by pride cometh contention, but with the well-advised is wisdom. Whenever there's contention, whenever there's an argument, whenever there's a disagreement, whenever there's a battle, whenever there's a war, mark it down, pride is involved there somewhere. Only by pride is there contention. Think about what goes on between you and your spouse at home. When you have a disagreement, it's because your wife thinks she's right, and you know you're right, right? Isn't that how that works? Now, you wives, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Your husband knows he's right, right? No question about it in his mind. You're actually right, but he, th- he knows he's right, right? That's how it comes around. That, that's how it works. Uh, it's only by pride. And when one person humbles, uh, both of them humble each other, uh, th- then, then they c- you can reconcile. But, but pride brings contention. Also in Proverbs, the beginning of strife is as, one w- w- is, w- is as when one letteth out water. And I, I don't think I need to explain that anymore. Um, bodily functions are talked about a lot in the Scripture. <laughs> You know, once, once you start, it's hard to stop. That's, that's what it's talking about. The beginning of strife is as when one letteth out water. Once you start, it's hard to stop. Therefore, leave off contention before it be meddled with. It is kill your pride. Don't even get into contention with somebody. There are some times when you do have to assert yourself, but it should be done in humility usually for the good of the situation, maybe the good of the other person. And someone has said it this way, uh, it's uh, discretion is the better part of valor. You've ever heard that before? Another way to say it is choose your battles. Don't just fight with everybody about everything. You don't have to be right about everything. There are some times you can be right and let the other person win the argument. So, It depends on what the situation is, whether you assert yourself and do something and tell somebody that, 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 uh, no, it's not that way, it's this way. Like uh, if if somebody's cutting wood on a a saw, a table saw, and they don't put their goggles in, on, uh, it's okay if they think they they shouldn't have goggles on or don't need to wear their goggles. um, Assert yourself and say it's for your own safety. You need to do it, you know? That's an argument worth having. Uh, wearing your mask, like this afternoon. We're going to have a lot of people here. I'll talk about more of that in a little bit. Uh, if you come this afternoon, we want you to wear a mask. I went to my doctor. My doctor said, Paul, you need to wear a mask. I said, really? You think a, you think a mask is going to keep me from getting sick? He says, I don't care if you get sick. You're just ugly. Put the mask on. Sometimes you just got to say it, right? <laughs> but God's judgment, God's judgment is going to be on those who are prideful. As coals are to burning coals and wood to fire, so is a contentious man to kindle strife. That's how it starts, right? And then we see in Romans chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, but after thy hardness and a penitent heart. Now, wait a minute. Let me back up just a second and, and just put this in context again. I know we just went through the book of Romans not long ago, but they're not, not everybody in here was here, here during that, that series. Paul is talking in the book of Romans about sinfulness. He takes chapter 1 to establish the fact that all Gentiles are lost without Christ. Here in chapter 2, he's taken the whole chapter to talk about how all Jews are lost without Christ. Now, the Jewish people one of whom was Paul, knew how prideful the Jewish people are. After all, God chose us out of all the other nations of the world. We're better than everybody else because we're God's chosen people, right? God gave us the law. He didn't give it to the Gentiles. God showed up with us, and He lived with us in the tabernacle between the cherubims uh, on top of the mercy seat. He didn't do that with the Gentiles. 
God does miracles in Israel. He doesn't do that in the Gentiles. They were very prideful. So Paul is talking specifically to the Jewish people, but it applies to everybody. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasure up unto thyself wrath, anger, against the day of wrath and anger, a revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. To them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor, excuse me, and immortality, eternal life. In other words, those who do right, those who follow the Lord, have eternal life. But unto them that are, what? Contentious and do not obey the truth. And I don't know about you, but if you've ever shared the gospel with somebody who argued with you about the gospel, that book's full of myths. It's written by men. You can't trust anything in there. There are so many different versions. How do you know which one is right? There's a whole lot of stuff that, that's not true in that Bible. I hear that contention all the time time. But the, the, to them that are contentious and do not obey the truth but obey unrighteousness, they will receive indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also to the Gentile, for there is no respect of persons with God. God treats everybody just the same according to his rules, according to his laws, and according to his standards. But here's the second point I want to get across. Restlessness leads to violence. Remember, discontent discontent leads to restlessness. Restlessness leads to violence. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 11, <clears throat> we find that in the days before Noah, the earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. Also, in Genesis chapter 6, two verses later, it says, And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, and for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Now, those of you who know your Bible real well, you're already thinking what I'm thinking, that as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. I believe this verse is being fulfilled right now. I believe the earth is filled with violence, and it's getting worse all the time. Columbus has more homicides than it has ever had in its history. Every year, the homicides go up. I remember the first year we passed 100 homicides in a year, and I thought, oh, my goodness, can't believe it. Now we're way past that now. People are shooting each other for no reason. Sometimes just driving down the road, and they're shooting each other. Other, It's like Los Angeles, because I hear that happens out there. You cut somebody off on the freeway, they, they shoot you. And for a whole lot less, rest, le, less reasons, like somebody just disrespects you or something, boom, they get the death penalty on the spot. That is the kind of violence that the Lord is talking about here. Violence is happening all the time. In Psalm 11, verse 5, David wrote, The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked and him that loveth violence his soul hateth. Saying that God hates those who are violent. Folks, there is no justification for violence. And I'm not just talking about uh, murders. I'm talking about all kinds of violence. I'm talking about rioters in the streets all over the country. There's a rioting going on. If, if, uh, if, if they don't agree with something that happens, uh, uh, say, by the police or by the government, then all of a sudden they're going to go down to a Walmart, throw a rock through the window, and take whatever they want out of the store. How does that solve the problem? And it might be something that happened uh, across the country in a city over there, but here in our town, 3,000 miles away, I'm going to go down and throw a chair through a window and rob the store because I'm upset at what happened on the other side of the country to somebody I don't even know. By somebody, I don't even know for sure whether they did it that way or not, but I heard through the news that that's what they did, and that's why they did it. They had bad people, so I'm going to go steal me some a radio or a TV or something. Dating myself, nobody steals radios anymore. <laughs> right? But there is no justification for violence. Unless it's self-defense, 
unless you're defending yourself or some other innocent person. The Bible uh, 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 condones that, but condemns all other types of violence. You know, some of the most violent people in Jesus' day were the Roman soldiers. Jesus was approached by some soldiers who asked him for advice on how they should behave. They appreciated who he was, how, his, how he conducted himself and his ministry, and he answered, whoops, let me back it up. And the soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, And what shall we do? And he said unto them, Do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, which is another form of violence, and be content with your wages. Because those are things that they were all uh, upset about. They, they had a propensity for violence, as you saw in the way they crucified Jesus. They went far beyond what Pilate told them to do. They took pleasure in, in, in beating him almost to death before they actually crucified him. This was what they did. The Roman soldiers were known for that. <clears throat> and also accusing people falsely so that they could, uh, well, I don't want to go into all that, and their wages. They were upset with their wages too, as any soldier is. Probably most other people are too. So he says, be content with your wages. But the, the key words here, do violence to no man and be content. Be content. If you're content, you won't be violent to people. So once again, contentment is the key. But then we go to the next point, the, the, last, uh, the third major point on your handout. Violence leads to revolution. Discontent leads to... <clears throat> Excuse me. Discontent leads to restlessness. Restlessness leads to violence. Violence leads to revolution. And I believe that's what's going on in our country right now. I believe that we are in the midst of what some people are, are trying to do. That, uh, they were doing it back when I was a teenager in the 60s. Some of the same groups are doing this under different names, different covers. But there is an attempted revolution going on in our country. And if you're a Christian, if you're seeing things from God's point of view, you'll see this going on. This is what's going on. Uh, the, those who are riding on our, st our city streets are not just protesters. There are legitimate protesters in different places across the country, but there are also others who are piggybacking on the protesters, and they are engaged in violence for political purposes. Do some of the research on some of these groups that are being violent on our streets. What do they really stand for? Now, some of you are not going to like some of the things I'm about to say, but, but uh, I'll just take a couple, just a couple of instances in point, because uh, some people will think this is political. I don't think it is. I think it's a moral issue, not a political issue. I believe that black lives matter, but I do not believe in the organization called Black Lives Matter. I differentiate between the two. Black lives definitely do matter. There's no question about that. I thought that way long before BLM was even founded. I believe that way 60-some years. But if you look up the organization called Black Lives Matter, you'll find that it is a Marxist organization. It's a socialist organization. They are uh, advocating for abortion on demand. They're advocating for uh, LGBTQ rights. What does that have to do with BLM? What does abortion have to do with BLM? Abortion was, was promoted by Margaret Sanger is specifically to kill black people, as we talked about when we talked about racism some weeks ago, and as I talked about last year. So BLM is not just about Black Lives Matter. That's their cover story, but it is a subversive Marxist organization dedicated to the overthrow of the United States. Look it up. You look it up on their own website. It's right there, unless they've taken it down since I researched it. How about those who are uh, wanting to defund the police? Are there bad cops? Yes, there are. Unfortunately, there are. But is the solution to defund the police and get rid of the police? No. What would that lead to? If there were no police, what do you think this country would be like, really? Think about it. Yeah, we'd be overthrown in a heartbeat. It'd be total anarchy. We'd be at each other's throats. It's the old, old west again. Everybody's going to strap a six-gun to their hip, and they're going to have shootouts in the street at high noon. And I'm not overestimating that. If there are no police, we're in trouble. 
So those are just two examples. These are bad solutions that are designed to undermine our country. They will not solve our problems. They will make the problems worse. It leads to more violence. Politicians won't solve our problems either. Politicians are out for themselves. We have problems because we are a society made up of, this is going to astound you, get ready, get ready. This is, this is, this is deep, deep, okay? We're a society made up of, are you ready? People. <laughs> and people are sinners. All of us, every one of us. We're all sinners. That's why you're here. You're in a sinner's hospital. That's what a church is. This is not a museum for saints. It's a hospital for sinners. We recognize that we have problems, that we need the Lord. We need each other to encourage each other to get closer to the Lord. Amen? The answer to our problems as a people, as a person, as people, as a nation, is Jesus Christ. That has always been the case. It will always be the case. And the further we get away from the Lord, the further we get closer to the, the second coming of the Lord. Because we are in the days before Noah. It's repeating itself. Okay? So <clears throat> there are problems that need to be fixed, but Jesus is the answer. Jesus, in his day, never advocated for discontent. He never advocated for contention. He never advocated for revolution. And think of where he lived at the time. He was living in Israel as a Jew under the domination of the Romans. One of the most despotic empires in world history. The Romans were very oppressive, yet Jesus never criticized the Romans. He never uh, raised an army to fight against the Romans, to overthrow the Romans. Never did that. He was never contentious against them. What did he say instead? 2 Peter chapter 2. The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations, and that word is testings, okay? To deliver us out of testings and to reserve the unjust under the day of judgment to be punished. In other words, let the Lord handle those problems out there. Okay, again, keep in mind, you can defend yourself or defend somebody who's innocent, but otherwise, we're not to fight back, Okay? Let the Lord handle that, but chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness. And here we're going to, again, we're going to step on some toes here and despise government. Despise government. Presumptuous are they, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Whereas angels, which are greater in power and might, bring not railing accusation against them before the Lord. I'm going to get a little bit ahead of myself here, but how many times have you seen on social media this year people criticizing the government, people criticizing those in authority? I'm not just talking about politicians. I'm talking about the police. I'm talking about preachers. I'm talking about teachers. I'm talking about anybody in a position of authority. We are sinners, and we like to complain about anybody in authority from our uh, it, it could be our dads, it could be our bosses, uh, it, it, it could be anyone. It can be the mayor, it can be the governor, it can be the president, or anybody in between. We love to complain about people in authority, don't we? Isn't that what we do? Isn't that what you see on so social media? The Bible says not to do that. We are not to be self-willed. We, we shouldn't be speaking evil of dignities. Angels, which are greater in power and might than we are, don't complain about demons. That's what this is talking about. <clears throat> but these, these who do complain, as natural brute beasts, made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things that they understand not. Now we, as, as children of the light, as children of God, we should know better. We should understand that God is in charge, not the people in Washington, not the people at the Capitol downtown, not the people at City Hall downtown. It's God who is in charge. So they don't understand that. They don't understand that God is in control and shall utterly perish in their own corruption and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. And haven't we had that this year? 
people who take pleasure in rioting in the daytime. Now here it gets even more stark. Jude, verse 6 and verse 8. Jude is talking about judgment, God's judgment on, uh, well, coming up on the future, and he uses several different examples, but here he talks about the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. Genesis chapter 6, that's another topic for another time. He hath reserved them in everlasting chains under darkness under the judgment of the great day. That is a great white throne judgment. Likewise also, these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. So this is one of the, the characteristics that is, that, that is a trait of, of those who hate God and hate God's government because all power comes from God. We also see in Jude, verses 14 through 21, and Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, these people who despise dominion, these end-time rabble-rousers, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Think he uses ungodly enough? Four times in one sentence? These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts and their mouths, speaking great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. How that they told you that there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts, that is doing what they want to do for their own benefit. Those are my words, by the way. These be those who separate themselves, sensual, having not the Spirit. Notice notice that's capitalized, not that's the Holy Spirit. But ye, beloved, speaking to us, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. We are to be different from the world, in other words. We're not to behave like the rest of the world. In other words, if you claim to be a Christian... If you claim to be Christ-like, then be Christ-like in your conversations with others about government and its leaders. Now, that's crucial as we head up to this election. I'm hearing a lot of vitriol and hatred between people, even people who call themselves Christians, even people who are members of this church, members who are on this side of the fence over here and members who are on this side of the fence over here and at each other's throats over politics, which is temporary, which is going to pass which doesn't make a a bit of difference in eternity because God rules over eternity and politicians are not going to fix everything. It's not going to happen. We've been making laws now for, what, 244 years, right? 1776 to now, is that 244 years? And and, and we've got full-time lawmakers in Washington who have been making laws trying to fix everything for 244 years. How are they doing with that? Are we better now than we were 244 years ago? Well, I wasn't around then, almost, but, but I don't think things are going any better. So we should be Christ-like in our conversations with people about government and politics. Um, and it also applies, by the way, to social media, Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, uh, TikTok, all these different things. We should be we, we should you know, voice our opinions, but don't, don't rail on the other candidate or those who are currently in power. Uh, I don't, and I'm not just talking about presidential election. I'm talking about mayor. I'm talking about governor, I'm, the, the state government, local government, police. We shouldn't be railing on authorities like that. When we do that, we are teaching young people not to respect authority. And no wonder we're having problems with our kids today because we're teaching them not to respect authority by the way we respect authority over us or not respect it. <clears throat> it's not okay to speak evil of leaders because their authority is given by God and, and, and comes from Him. Look at how uh, Jesus spoke to Pilate who had power of life and death over him. Pilate says unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Why don't you answer me? Don't you know that I have power to crucify you and have power to release you? Jesus answered, you couldn't have any power at all against me except it were given thee from above. Therefore, he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. Talking about the Jewish leaders. They have the greater sin. 
He says, you don't have any power at all unless God gave it to you. The, the next sentence, which I don't have up there, is from that moment, Pilate sought to release him because Pilate full well understood what he was talking about. <clears throat> Jesus said that to Pilate. Pilate didn't criticize him for what he was doing. Pilate was about to sentence him to death. He hadn't done anything wrong. Jesus was totally sinless and innocent. Yet he didn't complain about Pilate who was going to make a bad decision and send him to the cross. Well, in that situation, if he wasn't going to complain about leadership, what right do we have to complain? Boy, it's quiet in here. <clears throat> so let me conclude with this passage. Jesus saying, these things have I spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. We're not going to have it in this society. We're not going to have it in America. It's going to get worse and worse. You always wanted to go in the rapture, didn't you? Haven't you been praying for the rapture? Right? Okay. Well, if you want to go up in the rapture, things are going to have to get worse and worse and worse and worser before that happens. Next week we'll talk. Yeah, change your mind. Yeah. Next week we'll talk about another aspect that, that, that is taking place that confirms, I think, in my mind, that the return of the Lord is coming very, very near. But I want you to, to, to see what he says. These things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation. And here we are. So not talking about the great tribulation. It's talking about trouble. Talking about trials. How many of you are going through trouble right now? How many of you have gone through trouble? How many are going to go through trouble? I know you don't want to think that. But if you haven't already, if you're not now, you will. It's life. It's life. We will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. Cheer up, he says. I have overcome the world. I have overcome the world. <clears throat> I think we can have two points of view. We can say, oh, my goodness, oh, my goodness. It's the end of the world. It's the end of the world. Or we could say, oh, my goodness, oh, my goodness, it's the end of the world. The Lord's coming back. <laughs> Same exact thing, two different points of view. The scripture says, the Lord says, look up for your redemption draweth nigh. Let's stand with our heads bowed, our eyes closed. <clears throat> I want to give you an opportunity to respond to what you've heard here today. I don't know what the Lord's speaking to you about. I have no idea. The Lord has a way of applying every message in a different way to each heart. My basic message is, as believers, we need to be different from the people out there. We need to conduct ourselves as Christians. Not just about elections, but about everything. We need to be kind to other people and show them and teach them and demonstrate to them that we as believers need to be different from everybody else out there. You know what? Um, in the big scheme of things, I mean, I have a choice in this election, and I think you have a choice, and you, you should vote on your choice. I urge you to do that. But in a bigger scheme of things, I know I shouldn't say this as an American, but it doesn't really matter to me who gets elected because whoever gets elected, God put that person there. Because all authority comes from God. According to Romans chapter 9, God sets leaders up. God tears leaders down. And the only thing that matters to me is that God is on the throne and he's the one. That flag there, that's the one I serve under. So let's just conduct ourselves as Christians, not as partisan Americans. All right? There's a difference. Father, thank you so much for being the God that you are for loving us as we are. Thank you, Father, for being in control over everything in this world, everything in our lives, everything in our whole situation, every situation we face from day to day. Father, I pray that you would grant us the peace that passes all understanding as we bring every burden, every fear, every failure, every victory, every, everything that we go through, everything that we think, everything that we feel. Help us, Father, to bring them to you and lay them at your feet and pour ourselves out to you and then claim the peace that passes understanding and then to think on things that are positive and have good virtue. Father, I preach you'd help us to be people who will lift others up and not tear them down. 
May you help us each to be encouragers, to be world changers, to be world builders, to be building a world that, that is pleasing to you in your kingdom. May your will be done. In this invitation with each of us, may our responses here honor and glorify you. For we ask it all in Jesus' name, for his sake, and with thanksgiving, amen. Whatever the need, whatever the need, you come. We'll have counselors up here. We'll be glad to pray with you about anything if you want us to. and please be seated for just a couple minutes. Got uh, three announcements here I need to make. As you undoubtedly saw as you came in the parking lot today, uh, there's some unusual things out there that we don't normally see. Uh, we, um, we're not going backwards into time uh, because we have the outhouses out there. Uh, <laughs> we're going to keep the new ones, but uh, we've added those because we have the Fall Fun Fest this afternoon from 4.30 to 6.00. And so we've got some extra uh, bathrooms outside. Everything's going to be outside this year uh, because of uh, COVID. Uh, we want to uh, uh, keep everybody out in the fresh air. It makes it easier for social distancing, especially with the number of people that we plan to have. 
Uh, there are tents out there as well. We're, we've got inflatables out there. Uh, we're going to have food and, and things of that sort. We're going to have carnival games as well. Now, because of that, we're going to need a lot of help. So if you can stay to help us set up for the Fall Fun Fest, we're going to encourage you to go over to the connector immediately after the service. Uh, we have lunch already ordered and probably on its way. Uh, we'll have that just uh, very, very soon. In just a few minutes, we'll have the lunch, and then we're just going to spend the afternoon setting up for the the uh, Fall Fun Fest this afternoon. And so if you can do that, we'd really appreciate that. I'm going to also ask you if you can help this afternoon. Um, be here by 4 o'clock. If you can't help set up, that's fine. If you can be back here at 4 o'clock to help, uh, d- help us with the games and the refreshments, we need a lot of help. We have 13 games that we're going to be running, <clears throat> so we need folks to kind of oversee those games. And they're going to be very, very easy games uh, they, you won't have to be in cl- close proximity with anybody. We're all going to keep our social distancing. The games are, are going to be so that the kids are, are a, a distance from you. Uh, we'll give out candy at the games. We'll have, uh, of course, refreshments. We're going to have candy, cotton candy. We're going to have uh, hot dogs, corn dogs, water that we're distributing. Steve Harney is going to be this afternoon. And that's been an interesting roller coaster ride this week. Steve called me on Thursday and said he was not feeling well uh, to pray for him. He's got some symptoms that sounded pretty scary. And Friday morning, he canceled. Uh, He went and got a COVID test. It didn't sound good at all. Uh, And then yesterday uh, afternoon, he told me that he passed the COVID test. It was negative, and he felt better, so he's going to be here today. So, But we weren't sure how that was going to work out. Uh, So that's really good because... Well, there's going to be a lot of people here that need the gospel and a whole lot of people who are going to be here for the trunk or treat. So if even if nothing else, if you can be here at 5.30 for trunk or treat and we'll park you in the back here. If you are going to be here for trunk or treat, if you can hand out candy in the back, I'm going to ask you to sign up in the lobby so we can reserve a parking spot for you. So we know how many people are going to be doing that, okay? And bring enough candy for a lot of kids. Let me tell you, as of... 10.15, was it? Uh, 10.15, Tammy came back and told me, uh, as of now, and registrations are still coming in, we have 600 kids registered, almost 200 parents registered. So we're going to have over 800 people this year. That's an amazing total. So everything's going to be outside. It's going to be kind of busy. So we we need a lot of help, folks. This is our biggest uh, outreach event of the year, and we need all the help that we can get. If you can help us with the games, if you can help us with the refreshments, help us with the trunk or treat, help us with setup, anything you can do is really desperately needed. Now, having said that, all that, let me say this. If you are at risk of COVID, please don't come. It's going to be, a, it's, there's going to be a lot of people. I mean, we're going to do our best to social distance, but it's going to be impossible for you to not to be in close proximity with somebody. So if you are at risk, please don't come. If you do come, I'm going to ask you to wear a mask this afternoon, if you would, okay? That's very, very important for us to do that. We don't want you getting sick. We don't want you making anybody else sick, and we don't want you, be any, you, we don't want you scaring anybody because of the way you look. I mean, I've already talked about that myself. But we do need a lot of help, okay? Uh, I want to emphasize that. We need all the help we can get. This is a major event, and we're, gonna, we're going to brainstorm during our our um, staff retreat as to how we can do this a little differently next year. We already have some ideas about that. But right now, we're going to be overwhelmed. Okay, so we need all the help we can get. Okay, second announcement I have, uh, kind of personal. My dad's birthday is Tuesday. He's going to be 90 years old. So please wish him him a happy birthday. So uh, just wanted to let, let you know about that. And then also next Sunday afternoon will be our membership class. That'll be 3 o'clock next Sunday afternoon. If you are thinking about joining Crossroads, just want more information about Crossroads, just come next Sunday afternoon at 3 o'clock in the connector, and we will have some refreshments for you. We'll have a lot of information for you and give you a better uh, basis on which to decide whether you want to become a member of Crossroads, okay? All right, let's close in prayer and ask God to bless us as we go our various ways. Again, Brother Don, if you would come up and dismiss us, please. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the message today. We thank you for Pastor Paul and his uh, 
love for your word and his study of your word and to be able to present it to us in a, in a way that everyone can understand. Father, we just ask to bless him in a special way, and this is uh, Pastor Appreciation Month, and Lord, we do appreciate him very much, and we just want to show it so much. Father, we just ask you to continue with the message today. May the Holy Spirit take it and apply it to hearts. Uh, may it find lodging in hearts uh, as you uh, wish it to be. Father, we also ask you to pray for our government and the voting that's coming in the next week and a half, that your will would be accomplished in that, that the right person uh, would be elected. And Father, we know that uh, you're in control of the whole thing anyhow. And uh, Father, we just ask you to take control over all the division in our government. Uh, Father, it, it, a house divided will fall and a government divided is, is already falling. Father, we just uh, ask you to bless this day, bless each person that's come and bring us back at the next appointed time, ready to hear your word again. We'll give you the praise and honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.